What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to The Right Mindset. I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and today we are going to go over the ancient saying of show, don't tell. I want to go over different ways to look at show, don't tell, and what they are really trying to explain when it comes to writing. Let's be honest, all that you write is technically telling as you are telling people what is going on. So, what is show? Don't tell. That's what we will go over today and six rules to help you better show over telling in your stories. And as we have been saying, it's time to develop the right mindset. Let's go. Thank you to everyone who has been watching these videos, supporting these videos, liking these videos, sharing these videos, just showing this channel so much love. I want to show you love. And for those who are first timers, if you like what you end up seeing and you like the other videos involved, please subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out. Let's get right to it. So today's lesson is going to be about show, don't tell. But what is show, don't tell? The term show don't tell, is a technique for writing, usually for novels, that allows the verbiage a chance to let the reader experience a story through actions, words, thoughts, senses, and feelings, rather than through the author's uh, exposition, summarization, and descriptions. This could relate to a story being felt through sensory details or actions happening rather than exposition. Remember, you are what you do, not what you say. If I tell you I am awesome, <laughs> which I am, uh, then it is a lie to the reader and has no emotional truth. How can you believe me if I say I am awesome? I am awesome. There is no proof in what I said. It's my word against yours. If I show that I am awesome through action without having to say I am awesome, it becomes a truth in the mind of the reader because they are seeing it and becoming emotionally connected to the discovery they personally got to experience. They're experiencing the character being awesome and then they choose to say to themselves, the character is awesome. If as a writer, you are doing your job, you should be representing what makes an, a character awesome. And if the reader is seeing that unfold on the page, they themselves start experience what it is you want them to see, which is that that character is awesome. Show don't tell helps to draw a reader in to a much more immersive experience, giving them a chance to be in the rooms you create. Think of a show, don't tell, as a chance to write out moments that transmit experiences to the reader rather than just informing the reader of the experience. There is a major difference between telling your reader the woman is freezing over showing the reader here we go. Showing the reader that she shivered so aggressively that snow couldn't stay on her shoulders. She pulled up her thick wool scarf to get from her car to the building. She ducked her head behind her double gloved hand against the bitter January air. In essence, show don't tell is accomplished through a variation of vivid imagery, descriptive words, uh, verbs, and immersive details now oh look at that hmm? look at that difference different approaches and it's real goal all right it's being the show don't tell let me say this much what you write isn't always telling just because we as writers wrote she shivered so aggressively that snow couldn't stay on her shoulders 
isn't telling the reader that she is cold. It is showing your reader that she is not only cold, but struggling. It could have been as easy as Claire is struggling with the cold weather and call it a day. If I wrote Claire is struggling with the weather, uh, with the cold weather, I'm not showing anything. I am exposing or placing exposition. You as the reader need to know that Claire is struggling with the cold weather. But that's not showing much other than telling you what is going on through a play-by-play. We'll get back to the play-by-play mentality. I've worked with people who believe that anything you say is considered a form of telling. All right, Their minds couldn't comprehend that an uh, expression of movement through a scene is not the same as telling someone what they are going through. That Claire... Okay, if we go if we go back to the the example, all right, right here. Okay, this is what I'm reading. That Claire is struggling with the cold weather is the same as she shivered so aggressively that snow couldn't stay on her shoulders. She pulled up her thick wool scarf. Okay, they believe both are telling, and the reason when we write both phrases, we are essentially telling the reader what is happening so what is the difference there is actually a difference claire is struggling with the cold weather is right is the writer telling the audience what is going on on the surface of the experience whereas she shivered so aggressively that the snow couldn't uh, couldn't stay on her shoulders. She pulled up her thick wool scarf to get from her car to the building. She ducked her head behind her double gloved hand against the bitter January air. Okay. Okay. This is the writer showing the audience what is going on through experience. This is what the person is experiencing. Okay. Yes, the writer is telling the reader that she shivered and she pulled up her thick wool scarf, right? Wool, all right? As you can see, it was an experience with a reaction to that experience. When Claire is struggling with the cold weather, it's just telling you what is going on, not what she is experiencing through her mental, emotional, and physical process. Are you confused? Me too, a little bit. So let's do this. We're going to look at a different approach than saying show, don't tell. For anyone out there that cannot see the difference, all right, Uh, what we will do is that by understanding what the real goal is, we'll be able to represent a visual of uh, the moments. So when you are writing, you're responsible to pull the reader in. In the last video in this series, we went over imagery. Imagery is a visual representation of not only what someone sees, but allowing the mind to feel, hear, taste, touch, and visualize the movement in a different way. Imagery is one of the tools to help you pull a reader in. This is why you need to look at your writing and say to yourself, am I simply writing an account of what happened in a blow-by-blow scenario Or am I allowing the reader to feel what the characters are going through personally? If you're writing sentences like she got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared. Chris was having a hard time driving in the rain or Melissa was full after she ate dinner. Okay, again, if it's she got out of the car. All right, if we. If we pop this over here so you can see it, I want you to see it. So if we're looking at these three things, right? All right. She got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared. This is telling because we are just giving a play, a blow by blow. It's a play by play account 
of what happened. She got out of her car, ran for her life. She was scared. If we say Chris was having a hard time driving in the rain, it's just a blow by blow. It's a play. It's literally what is happening. Chris was having a hard time driving in the rain. I'm letting you know it's an account of what has happened. If Melissa was full after she ate dinner, it's just an account or an observation of what has happened for that dinner. These moments are not written through the experience of those three characters, okay? They are written accounts of what happened, sort of like you telling a police officer. Uh, yes, uh, officer, I saw this woman get out of the car and run for her life. She looks scared. Uh, to me, she looks scared. You know what, uh, officer? My friend Chris cannot drive in the rain. He was having a hard time. Oh, uh, yeah, It's odd because I love that all my friends, including Melissa, ate two plates and filled up on dinner. These are just accounts of what happened. I'm not able telling a police officer what the other person was feeling. I'm only able to tell you what I saw. And I can't even tell you what I feel because what I saw was just a physical thing. I saw a woman get out of her car, ran for her life. She looked scared to me. To me, it looked like she was scared. It's an account. Okay. Think about the those three moments and ask yourself what you really felt. Did you feel like you learned something about who they were as people? For example, did they make choices and work through the process of their experiences? When the sentence was over, uh, how much could you relate to what they did? Again, she got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared. Did we feel like we learned anything about who they were? Well, we learned that she's scared and she's she ran out of a car, but we're not seeing process. We did not see her make choices and go through a process. We know that she got out of the car and ran for her life, but there's no process to why she got out of the car and why she ran for her life and why she was scared. When the sentences were over, how much could you relate to what they did? Well, how can you relate to someone being scared if we don't know why they're scared? How can you relate to somebody being a bad driver if we don't know how they were driving? And how can we know that someone is full if we don't understand what they did to get there? Okay. How about we look at the first sentence in a way where we can experience their process of the moment? So let's, we're going to take this sentence. Okay. We're going to come down here. Boop. All right so we can get a full full screen for you all right so it's going to go from she got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared and it's going to become sarah stopped the car inches from the parking garage wall in a frantic swivel she scanned the back and side windows why did i honk the horn a car squeal pierced through her closed windows she jumped out of the car which was not in park and moved till it pressed against the wall before the door on the other car closed she was already slamming on the elevator buttons her breathing hid the casual footsteps approaching her a sense of freedom pulsed over her skipping heart with the ding of her escape opening she took a step forward only to feel the weight of her attacker's push knock her against the elevator wall and into darkness now remember I could have easily written the whole moment like this. She got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared. She got to the elevator and pressed the buttons. When the elevator door opened, she pushed it in by an she was up. Uh, when the elevator door opened, she was pushed in by an unknown attacker. She hit her head and was knocked out. There is a major difference. Um between showing and telling telling is always going to be an account of with no experience this is an account officer i just want you to know uh that she got out of the car and ran for her life i saw that she was scared from my perspective she got to the elevator and she was pressing the buttons and ultimately when the elevator door opened she was pushed in by the unknown attacker i saw that she hit her head and she was out okay 
which one was an experience of the situation and which one was telling you what happened in a blow by blow account. The above example lets us work through the situation. Sarah stopped the car inches from the parking garage wall. This is indicating, okay, if, if well, we'll get to the next one. This is indicating she almost has no perception or control because she is internally freaked out or scared. There's something going on where she's, you know, she's not in control of her ability or her reflexes. Uh, she is unknown. She is not aware of who's chasing her and w if they're still behind her. So it's a frantic sw uh, swivel, right? She scanned the back and side windows. So we know that she has to be scared in this or worried or concerned or disoriented. She doesn't understand. She and she's probably in a location that isn't necessarily familiar to her. She just ran into it. Then this is an internal, you know, she talks to herself, right? She says, why did I honk the horn? So we know that there's a chance that she may have got frustrated with somebody and honked the horn at the car. A car squeal pierced through her closed windows. All right. So we know the. Uh, there's only one other sound in in the uh, we don't have to say the only only one car approaches or whatever the case may be. We're creating a moment with this, a mood, a feel, uh, you know, pierced is a very specific word. And it went through her closed windows. So the car itself is in the background, yet it still infiltrated her, quote unquote, safe space. And because of that, her response, her process was to we can say directly she jumped out of the car, which was not in park and moved till it pressed against the wall. So we know that she hadn't even at this point put the car in park. She was still in like flight mode to get the car out of there. But now she knows that the car or a car is, is there. Uh, so she's not thinking straight and her car hits the wall before the door on the other car closed. She was already slamming the button. So basically I don't have to say the person gets out of the car uh, and is walking over. Okay. Right now, it's still on her experience is that she's focused on getting out of there. So she needs a slam. She's slamming on those buttons. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. OK, so I have yet to say that she's scared. But I am showing her process and how she works through her fear. Right. And we know that she's breathing heavily because her breathing hid the casual. Now I'm saying she was she stood there breathing heavily. I used it as a way to add to the narrative and create more tension. Her breathing hid the casual footsteps approaching her. So not only is the footsteps coming to her with no urgency, which is for me, uh, um, pretty thrilling. Like it's like, okay, this person's calm and, and in control. And we don't even know if this is the person that is chasing her. It could just be somebody that got out of a car, but she is so out of her mind in fear that she's just freaking out, but she's breathing so heavily. She can't even hear the footsteps that are casual. Okay. A sense of freedom pulsed over her skipping heart with the ding of her escape opening. Oh, I I'm out. I finally made it because she doesn't know that there's someone coming, right? She took a step forward only to feel the weight of her attackers push, knock her against the elevator wall into darkness. There's so much going on there. We're getting a visual of it. We're showing her experience. We're letting her mind react to things. Uh, you know, we're seeing how, you know, just the car squeal pierced through her closed window influences her to take action. Influences. Okay. And that is a major difference between she got to, uh, you know, she got out of the car and ran for her life because she was scared. Well, now we know why she was scared. OK, we know that she honked the car and somebody started chasing her. That's implied. Right. We know that uh, we know why she got out of the car. She heard a car squeal pierce through her class window, which means that she feels like this might be the person, which it turned out it would might be the person that came in. She doesn't have time that she can't see anyone out there. She can't. She doesn't even want to look. She's just going to run for her life. If I can get to the elevator door, I will be fine <clears throat> in her mind. Right? OK, uh, she got to the elevator and pressed the buttons. Right. This is just an action. 
But if we know that she, before the door on the other car closed, she was already slamming the buttons. We know how fast she was running. We know what was pulling her to that door to her potential freedom. Okay. And then uh, when the door opens, she was pushed and knocked out by, uh, she was pushed by an unknown attacker. Okay. So this gives her breathing, hit the casual footsteps, a sense of freedom. We're letting the process within her emotionally, a sense of freedom pulsed over her skipping heart with the ding of her escape opening. So there's like a mixed feeling there. There's something like, oh, it opened. Okay. And then boom, she took a step and therefore she's knocked out. Beep. All right. I hope that helped. Here's six rules to show, don't tell. <clears throat> uh, and before I get to the sixth rule, I want you to remember, show is a tool used to pull the reader to a scene. By using it, you're creating a connection between the reader and your characters. Ultimately, you are utilizing show to help the reader interpret what's happening instead of telling them what they should understand or feel. Right. The big thing is you don't want to have to explain to your reader, which is exposition, what is going on emotionally or physically. You want them to experience and interpret that experience as they read it based on what they read. For example, if we go real back, go back to this real quick. What this means to you might mean something different to someone else, but what does stand to be true is that there is urgency. What stands to be true is that she is not in total control. What stands to be true is that she's trying to find what's chasing her. Okay. And the way we as readers experience that sentence is that's why it's showing us. It's showing us uh, into the doorway of the experience and letting someone, uh, which is the reader, have a moment with that. And ultimately, you utilize the show to help the reader interpret that. OK, your job is to let the reader create their own conclusions by showing concrete and vivid details uh, to them of the experience and show is something that keeps your reader actively involved in the story's narrative. Tell pulls them back to keep them passive on the plot. We are, as a, as, as a reader, following Sarah through this experience. Whereas this is telling you what she had done. This is showing you her experience because we, as the reader, get to walk through that experience. And this is saying, listen, we don't have time to go through the experience. I'm just going to give you the cliff notes. <laughs> All right. When you tell somebody... When you tell, you are taking away something very special, the reader's opportunity to discover the story for themselves. And they do this through their experience of reading the story and telling takes that away. You want them to form emotional bonds and live in the world you've created. When they do this through show, you help them add something personal to the scene and feel involved in the story. Telling takes all of this away. You are essentially taking away the chance to allow your readers to use their imagination, their experiences, and even personality. They can't make conclusions on their own since you're imposing yours on them. She was scared is your opinion. She got out of the car and ran for her life, ran for her life. OK, ran for her life. Um, ran for her life is the, a writer imposing their own conclusions and therefore we're not experiencing it. Uh, basically telling makes it so you are keeping the readers outside your story when you want it to be the opposite. You want them in it. Now that we kind of summarize that, let's jump right into, so here are the six rules to help you achieve bringing your audience into the experience. <clears throat> One, use evidence to support your claim. Again, 
what I say is not the truth. What I do is who I am, right? No matter how much I will, I'm a good person. I, you know, I, I, I'll do whatever I can for anyone. I'll be there. None of that means anything until I physically do it or show that I can do it. Okay. So use evidence to support your claims. When you tell people another person is trustworthy, there is no evidence to support these claims. If I tell you Jake or Melissa is trustworthy, there's no evidence uh, to support these claims. You want the reader to discover the truth about this trustworthy person and why they are trustworthy. You do this through evidence of discovery when your characters prove their worth. I call this process. When characters unbox and work through the scene themselves, that's when you see the process unfold in the story, either through what characters do or do not do, say or do not say. You let the reader figure out the truth of what their actions say, not what others are telling you to believe, and that's including the writer. We, the writer, should not tell people what they need to believe. We need to show through experience. So an example of telling is Chris grew up with Melissa his whole life. Okay. Now an example of showing, you know, I'll, I'll pop this on the page so you can see it. Okay. Boop. Let's do it. Boop, 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 boop. Let's do it. Like they do on the Discovery Channel. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the example of telling is Chris grew up with Melissa his whole life. An example of showing is every morning without fail, Melissa always stood there at the bus stop with two coffees. Much different than our morning drink boxes she'd surprise me with as children walking to school. She'd raise one cup to acknowledge me heading her way with that silly happy face and morning goodness in her hand. She knew she spoiled me. She knew I was lost in her high energy and grace. Then I'd grab my cup while being hugged by the smell of her perfume. My friends told me she she's loved me since the first grade, but we're in our thirties now and maybe I'm still scared of making her realize I'm still that silly little neighbor with double framed glasses. So the big difference here is Chris grew up with Melissa his whole life is an account of, I just want you to know uh, this, uh, that Chris grew up with Melissa his whole life. All right. There's no truth to that. We don't know that truth. However, this, this, this experience in first person, I wrote this in first person every morning without fail. Melissa always stood there at the bus stop with two coffees. This is a uh, narr this is narration inside the character thinking of this scene. Melissa always stood there much different than our morning drink boxes. She'd surprise me with as children walking to school. They've known each other since they were children. The coffee used to be uh, juice boxes. She'd raise one cup to acknowledge me heading her way with that silly, happy face and morning goodness in her hand. So he's acknowledging certain quirks about her. So he definitely knows her, observes her, uh, recalls very similar experiences. Uh, and, you know, she knew she spoiled me. <clears throat> Uh, she knew I was lost in her high energy and grace. Then I'd grab the cup while being hugged by the smell of a perfume. So there's an infatuation. I, uh, you know, we're saying that this character really likes. Uh, we're saying that Chris really likes Melissa because he's he's like, I, I love this moment. You know, this is uh, uh, hugged by the smell of her perfume. You know, my friends told me she's loved me since the first grade, but we're in our thirties now. And now this is like motivation and like hesitation and stuff like that. So we're working through their process, the character's process. All right. Uh, step number two, rule number two, rule number two, replace the abstract with the concrete. You want readers to see the truth through actions and not an abstract suggestion of what could be. If we were going to do another uh, example, uh, because I know I know you like examples, I like examples. Pop this on the page. I should add this on the page before we started, but hey, not not all perfect, right? Uh, 
All right. So example of telling is after her first kiss with Kevin, uh, Allie headed home with pure happiness in her heart. Okay. What does showing look like? After her first kiss with Kevin, Allie couldn't stop her smile, uh, her smile from greeting each stranger she passed on her way home. When she ran through the front door of her house with a quick hello to her parents up to her room, hopped through the air while closing the door and landing on her bed, she took a deep breath and picked the picked picked the landline. I should say picked up. Picked up the landline. He finally kissed me. She swoons to her friend on the other end. There is a big difference between after her first kiss with Kevin, Allie headed home with pure happiness in her heart. We're actually seeing the process of her happiness. We're seeing her just smile and not caring that other people are seeing it, you know, because it could be embarrassing where people's, you know, oh, are you smiling at me? What's going on? <clears throat> she didn't have time to talk to her parents. She needed to tell her friend, probably her best friend, what happened that it's taken this long. And he finally kissed me and woo, and, you know, she needed to get it out. She didn't have time to be like, yo, yo, yo. Hey, parents. She just kept going. So this is concrete evidence. Abstract is after her first kiss with Kevin, Allie headed home with pure happiness. We don't know that. There's no truth to that. <clears throat> We're not proving the, that it is the first kiss, for one. And we're not proving that Allie headed home with pure happiness in her heart. There's no proof. <coughs> Sorry about that. I apologize. Okay. Number three. Substitute vague descriptions with specific sensory details. This all comes down to playing with those sensories we all have, right? You want to stay away from vague descriptions and bring to the reader specific sensory details. Ultimately, you're drawing pictures with words that elevate the reader's mind through their own experiences of how they perceive the world. I have examples, so let's do it. You want examples? I got examples. Let's do it. Let's do it like I do on Discovery Channel. Yeah, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. So let's do it like I do on Discovery Channel. Okay. Today, <clears throat> the mall was packed. As I walked through, I could smell the food court calling me. Okay, well, let's look at the showing. I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of shopping done today since it took me four minutes to walk 20 feet from the mall entrance. My goal was to take on my Christmas list and between the ho-ho-ho of Santa off in a distance with a ryth rhythmically timed flash from a camera, the soul-sucking holiday standards blasting over the speakers, and me smelling freshly cooked pizza coming from the food mart, I was torn. What was I talking about? Pizza. I need pizza first, then the list. I can taste the melting cheese calling my name. That's in first person. So uh, today the mall was packed. As I walked through, I could smell the food court. So that's also first person. But, but, but. <clears throat> but again, there's no sensory. There's no vivid detail. It's... It's not specific in what the experience is. It's just an account. Hey, I just want you to know today the mall was packed. Uh, and I realized that as I was walking um, through uh, this packed place, uh, I could smell the food court. We're seeing process. I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of shopping done today. So they realized how packed the place was and how it's going to influence their goal. Okay. And then they tell you my goal was to take on my Christmas list uh, and between the ho ho of Santa. So oh, it's Christmas time. There's probably a long line, which is influencing, therefore pro process, influencing the fact that the place is packed. Uh, they're getting pictures with Santa. <clears throat> we could tell they're not really in the mood for Christmas, uh, especially with the holiday standards, soul sucking. All right, there's a lot going on there. But what brings them all back to the place is, ooh, pizza. So the food court calling me or what was I talking about? Pizza, right? Or the freshly cooked pizza coming from the food mart, right? I need pizza first, then the list. I can taste the melting cheese calling my name. All right. It's process. It's always about process and then working through stuff. All right. Okay. So now we're on rule number quattro. Let me let me put the rule there. Let me put the example up so you can see it. Example. <clears throat> okay. 
before we get to the example, let me tell you the rule. The rule is avoid relying too much on body language. We don't need stage directions squeezing their fists to be angry and cross their arms when they don't want to hear it. You can overdo it and take the reader out of the moment. Try allowing yourself to limit the straightforward actions and give us an insight <clears throat> into the character's choice. Yes, they might be angry, but why? Are they frustrated, si uh, slighted, or jealous? Hmm. Let it be more of a real-time account of the character's thought process and their interactions with the setting, which can show emotional nuance better than body language. So an example, <clears throat> just so you see it, an example is this. Davi opened his eyes and looked at his phone. His nap lasted nearly eight hours. He knew his partner was going to be pissed that he missed another dinner with his boss. Not again. His stomach rolled over when he remembered the last time he was late to their dinner. Another ten-year relationship wasted on stupidity. Ooh. All right, so let's look at an example. <clears throat> oh, first of all, Davi opened his eyes. That's... All right. So if that's telling, we want to be able to explore the process of that uh, and looked at his phone. That's also action. So that's just stage direction. His nap lasted nearly eight hours. How do we know? <clears throat> he knew his partner was going to be pissed that he missed his dinner. Not again. His stomach rolled over when he remembered the last time he ate dinner. Another 10 years of stupidity. So how do we turn this into something? How do we make action on this like movement unless the stage direction? So we know that he opened his eyes into the darkness of the room. So it's late. He yawned, now relaxed and well slept after a long work week. He sat up and reached for his phone. The moonlight was the first clue that it was now not w eh. now way past nine his phone was the other there were no missed calls on his phone from chris <clears throat> this was the final story said recalling a previous fight he had with his partner the last boyfriend was never granted a third chance and here davi wasted it on a much needed nap he said it wouldn't happen again he thought the phone alarm was set and now he knew he had to make it to the restaurant or fail his lover for the last time what? 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 All right. So, first of all, uh, instead of him just opening his eyes and looking at his phone, we're letting the room take it be taken in. Uh, he opened his eyes into the darkness of the room. So we know that it's late. He yawned. <clears throat> so he's been sleeping for a while. Uh, now relaxed and well slept after a long week. So, uh, uh. So we could actually, if we wanted to, we could do this. Boop. He, he yawned. He sat up and reached for his phone. So this is saying that like in mid yawn. So instead of saying he yawned, uh, you know, or instead of saying in mid yawn, he sat up and reached for his phone. So we could say uh, he yawned, uh, you know, he, he sat up and reached for his phone. The moonlight was the first clue that it was now past nine. And we don't need to say that. Okay. There were no missed calls on his phone from Chris. This was the final story, he said. Recalling a previous fight he had with his partner, the last boyfriend was never granted a third chance, and here Davi wasted it on a much needed nap. <clears throat> he said it wouldn't happen again. He thought the phone alarm was set, and now he knew it had to make it. Uh, he had to make it. Uh, or All right. So we're working through his process, it's a real time account. This is literally a real-time account of the process and the struggles of what the character is dealing with. Fun. Okay. Boop. All right. Rule number five, the emotion through dialogue. When in doubt, you always have dialogue to be direct about a person's feelings as one of the more powerful tools in your arsenal to help prove a character's feelings or personality to the reader. <clears throat> Uh, let's do this one. Paste. Ah, uh, All right, we're almost done. Almost done, I promise. Hmm. Alex was pleased to see Ellen. Oh, that's nice to know. How about if we show now as dialogue? 
You have no idea how much I needed to see you today. What do I owe this amazing surprise visit? Okay, <clears throat> this is not, I am pleased to see you, Ellen. There's no proof to that. <clears throat> this is emotional. You have no idea how much I needed to see you today. What I do owe, uh, what do I owe uh, this amazing surprise? So there's like, there's an emotional through line to that. Uh, obviously, you want to follow up <clears throat> with a little bit more physical action, maybe uh, maybe how the scene works, how they interact. Uh, did they hug first? Did they sit down right away? Uh, <clears throat> does, you know, does uh, Alex um, put down his phone when Ellen walks through the room? You know, things like that. All right. Number six. Number six. All right. Number six doesn't have any examples, but I will tell you. Filter observations through the narrative voice. The truth about show, don't tell will often mean going deeper into the narrative point of view. This works either when you're filtering the story through the lens of a character or jumping back to the distance of narrator. You want to use the world we see through the narrator as a way to experience what is true. There is a difference between the house was huge and his whole family could live in the kitchen alone. No examples, but an insight to the reality of it all. Let's talk about it. We all know that exposition is information dumping. I personally consider story exposition when a writer is setting up information to benefit the reader. <clears throat> Something I made up for myself and what I teach my clients is character exposition is when information benefits the characters. Why am I bringing this up? Think of an observation you bring up as either for the reader to know or the characters to experience. If the narrative voice is telling us that Oscar was uncomfortable around Bill, we know that this is story exposition. We need to know, the reader needs to know that Oscar is uncomfortable around Bill. Straightforward, right to the point, but there's no experience. It's not really showing the experience either. Character exposition would give us a chance to read it through the experience of the characters by having the narrative voice write, Oscar stiffened in his embrace. His arms could not find the will to wrap around Bill. That's a physical representation of the process and dealing with the situation. Final thoughts. There you go, show don't tell. <clears throat> Here's something you should think about when you're having difficulty showing instead of telling. Just tell. That's right. For now, in your first draft, you can get caught up in the writing of it all and lose momentum. A lot of the times you want the dialogue and action to be straightforward while you're getting your zero or first draft out. When I write my novels, I like to use the zero draft as an opportunity to say what needs to be said and do what I need to get done. When I go back to write it out or clean it up and make it pretty, I basically will uh, take some time and say, all right, what's the subtext to this? How do I put this direct dialogue into subtext or even action? How do I take this action and make it and, and build around it? How do I make it more show instead of writing? She got out of the car because she was scared and ran for her life. How do I turn that into a moment right, of an experience? Basically, uh, <clears throat> when my when I am writing my zero draft, I do bullet point beats. Uh, and each scene and chapter of my book. So I just bullet point everything out with just literally these beats. I need this to happen, this to be said, this to be felt, uh, this to be acknowledged. I need this information to be put out there. And then I use that as a guide to understand the movement in the story. I'll even write notes next to the moments like they are going to tell them one thing, but mean X, Y, Z. So this is, they're going to, they're trying to say this, but they're going to say this. All I'm saying is if you are having trouble with or want to get the story out of your head, but can't because you're focused on how brilliant you could write it the first time, begin with a play by play and take it from there. It's easier to write the verbatim down and then clean it up later. With that said, not all stories need to be 100% show and not all stories need to be 100% telling. All right. And telling in general is not bad. It's not considered bad writing. You can tell. Uh, you can tell. You can use tell in your stories. As I use my chapters for pacing and helping with story, you can also use show and tell as a way to control pacing. When a movement is important, 
you want to show that scene to allow readers to become more immersed in the scene. When it's a moment that you need to create a faster pace flow, telling might be more your speed. Just get it out, let it be boom, 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 boom. Remember, show brings the reader into the moment through the experience of the scene and telling is your experience of the scene being laid out. It isn't unheard of for a story to be mostly telling when your audience is there to be told what it is flat out like a child. Sometimes readers don't want to figure it out. They want straight talk. This is where a strong nar narrative voice comes in and takes over. When the narrator explains the moments with a simple right to the point flavor, your reader can just sit back and enjoy the read. Basically, showing will give your reader the experience of feeling the story through themselves and telling is them listening to the narrator giving them the story. You know, sometimes we just want to hear the story. We don't want to really kind of like think about it. One of the things that makes writing so amazing is how no other medium can fully replicate the experience of the written word. Movies and TV shows are a visual medium. Song is an audible, audible, audible uh, medium where words and notes create moods and flow through emotions. Us writers, we writers, specifically fiction writers, have the ability to control thoughts and feelings in the way that creates bottomless stories of possibility. When we tell... We can give you the world in ways other mediums can't. Movies and TV can't show you the inner thought process of a character. Writers can tell you things within a story that other visual storytelling platforms cannot. And for us, showing is meant to push writers to work for their readers and bring characters in the worlds they live in to life. Ultimately, showing means you have to take the author out of, out of, as the middleman. I'll repeat that. Showing means you have to take the author out as the middleman and let your audience, the reader, live the story from within themselves. There are many ways you can show specific elements, action, dialogue, sensory details, internal thought, and narrative voice. As I stated before, the first draft of a novel will usually be more telling than showing, and well, it should be. When it comes time to do the real work, go through and highlight what needs more color added. I'd focus on what feels vague and stands out as mostly an account of what happened and less of a process of how they experienced it. When you find that, maybe it's time to work on it and say, how do I make this more of an experience? In the end, the simple way to look at it is this. Showing is a dramatization of the moments and telling is a summary of the moment. The next video in this series will be the rule of three. We'll look into why the rule of three is a writing principle that suggests that a trio of entries such as events, character moments, or word use can satisfy or be more effective than other numbers. Oddly enough, readers are more likely to remember information conveyed in threes. Hmm, interesting. Question. What is your writing kryptonite? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, if you want to improve your craft and get a little bit of insight to the industry and learn from people like yourself, known as other authors and writers, uh, hit that uh, subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss out. I guess that's it. Is that it? We're done? I guess we're done. Hey, by the way, you got this far. If you don't have an answer to the question and you just want to leave a comment, Hit that like button. I'll talk to you next time. Oh, hey, as always, remember to keep developing the right mindset. Okay, bye.